You are listening to Investing Matters, brought to you in association with London South East. This is the show that provides informative, educational and entertaining content from the world of investing. We do not give advice, so please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Investing Matters podcast. Today, our Investing Matters global audience are in for an absolute treat because this interview is with one of the true Scottish, UK and global heavyweights of the independent asset management industry. None other than Martin Gilbert, FRSE, co-founder and former CEO of Aberdeen Asset Management and the executive chairman of Asset Co PLC, a holding company of a group of wealth asset management companies, a company that's primarily involved in acquiring and managing and operating wealth management activities and interests. Now, I can't go any further before I say this. Martin has a prestigious and long history in the asset management industry. And my question is not what is is FRSE, but why Martin hasn't thus far been given the achievement and enabled the title of Sir yet. Martin, hello, how are you? Good, I'm good. They're already... There was a Sir Martin Gilbert, which was the author. I know there is one. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I used to get mixed up with him. I was, uh, I remember I was in Washington once and they said, welcome back, Sir Martin. We've given you your usual upgrade. So I, <laughs> I didn't bother telling them I wasn't the real thing. So uh, no, it's, uh, it, thank you. Thank you for the intro. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be on the show, Peter. So uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you very, very much. Now, I, I will explain for those that don't know, because I didn't know before this, that the FRSE is a fellowship of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which is granted to individuals that have, to the Royal Institute Society of Edinburgh, have shown national, you know, standards globally by recognising imminent, imminently distinguished individuals. So very well done there, Martin, amongst all your many, many, many other awards that you've had. Um, so, Martin, I want to start, if I may, um, with... The conversation that led you and your co-founders um, around May time, 1983, Aberdeen FC beat Real Madrid to lift the European Cup Winners Cup. John Newitt comes on, scores an historic winning goal in extra time, and you and your fellow investors decide it's time. Time for us to take that leap and start a business of our own. Can you tell us about that and what what led to that sort of conversation and, and the start of um, Aberdeen, the Aberdeen Trust? Peter, that's a really good question. We um, we were, as you said, in a European Cup final. And interestingly, Aberdeen are the last team to beat Real Madrid in, a, in any European final. Um, of course, the great Alec Ferguson was our manager then. Um, so I've always bet on them when they reach the uh, when they reach the uh, final. But yeah, I think what we've got to remember about asset management was in the 80s, it was a really small cottage industry. There were no big fund managers. There were maybe two or three big ones like Mercury or or or, or companies like that. Um, and all asset managers in Scotland came out of either legal firms or accountancy firms. So Bailey Gifford being another good example, they came out of uh, a legal firm in Edinburgh. Ivory and Syme came out of an accountancy firm in Edinburgh. And we came out of a legal firm in, um, in Aberdeen, set up on our own with our, with our biggest client. We had 100 million under management uh, in um, June the 1st, 1983. Uh, and that started the journey we went on until we uh, merged with uh, Standard Life um, when we had about 350 billion on the management. And interestingly, I always say when anyone starts an asset management business, I always say, go for it and, and take a chance. But remember the first billion will be the hardest. That's a very, very good point. Uh, very well made there. Thank you for sharing that with us. And um, hopefully you're still in touch with Sir Alex, having given you the catalyst uh, for your fantastic journey. Yeah, I, I always remember he, I always remember him saying one thing, and I've always remembered it, which is he likes players with egos. They have to succeed. And, and same with fund managers as well. The good 
those that have, those, some of them have to succeed and uh, failure doesn't enter their vocabulary. And I always remember that. And I always remember him saying, I treat every player differently. Uh, there's not one player uh, I treat the same. And I've always used that with when I've been looking after the fund management team is treat them all as individuals and work out what, how you treat them, how, what, what they need from you. Um, and, and that's a very, very important aspect uh, to, 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 to fund management because it's a tough, tough industry being a fund manager. You're, met, you're monitored every day. You see whether you're performing well. And, and you've, got to, you've got to be supportive when things are going wrong for them and questioning when they're doing really well rather than the other way around. Because most people are supportive when things are going well, saying, what a great fund manager you are. And then when, they, when, they, when they're underperforming, you, people say, why? I mean, how have you done this? I mean, I didn't buy into this. You've got to treat that. It's got to be the opposite. Brilliant. No, no thank you for that re reply. Now, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to go back, if I may, a little bit, because I've got some questions to ask you about you know, taking, um, merging and taking over certain companies and how you look after individuals. And I'm going to ask that a bit later on. But I want to go back to that bit where you say, just get started. You're there in June 1983. And you then take the company on, you and your, your co-founders. You get to 1991 and you list. And that's usually a big step for any entity to, to take on. So 1991, you joined the London Stock Exchange as Aberdeen Asset, sorry, Aberdeen Trust PLC. You then later changed the name to Aberdeen Asset Management. But tell us about that transition from being part of a company, taking it to the IPO, and then being at the mercy of the markets for 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 for, for then on. Yeah, that's that's another really good point to to consider when you you start a company. Do you take it public? Do you stay private or or not? Um, we probably needed to be public because we were we grew the business by a, a mixture of organic growth and um, and acquisition. So it gave us the currency to make acquisitions. So often we would do a deal, um, the Deutsche deal or, or Credit Suisse deal when we bought Credit Suisse Asset Management is a better example. They took, they took paper and because it was quoted paper, they were, they were happy. They could share in the synergies, they could share in the growth and also gave them liquidity when they needed it. So yeah, it, it, it worked um, and it worked for us. I mean, I'm not suggesting for a minute for everyone that going public is the ideal uh, solution because there are certain disadvantages with it, especially nowadays with governance sort of more, uh, more prevalent than it was, these sort of things. A lot of people aren't suited to the public markets and for them, I would, I would, definitely say remain uh, remain in the remain in the private markets brilliant thank you for that reply now we move on to march 2017 or there thereabouts merger between standard life and aberdeen asset management valued aberdeen at 3.8 billion or there thereabouts and created at the time the uk's largest asset management firm with 660 billion in assets under management and it was the second biggest, I think, in Europe. Um, as a successful leader, entrepreneur, and investor, how does one quantify the adage of hard work, dedication, time, and compounding one's investment returns, Martin? Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think, I think every year when I was CEO and I was one of the longest serving CEOs and I would sit back at the end of the year and even in a year where you felt you hadn't done anything, you, um, you, you had achieved a lot. Um, so it, it, was, it was very much for us, it was very much slow growth what felt like slow growth we would and but every year we would achieve something so i mean it, it so let's assume 
I, I, I always say it took us 10 years to get to a billion, another 10 years to get to 25 billion, and another 10 to get to 300 billion. So it was funny. It was just, you never really, you never really, there was never really one event that really made us or, or almost, well, except, of course, the split cap crisis we had 2002, 2004, that almost broke us. But but we became a better company as a result. So, yeah, it was just it was gradual rather than uh, rather than one big deal or anything like that. So it was just 30 odd years of really, really, really hard work. Brilliant. I love the fact you touched on there. It shows your level of humility to touch on the, the split caps crisis um, there, Martin. So appreciate that. What were the greatest lessons um, investing wise and leadership wise from 1983? to 2017 for you then um you know you've, you've touched on this split caps bit as well yeah i think i think you know i always say to people i said it's it's how good you are in the tough times that will define you as a ceo not how you did in the good times because it's very easy to ride the the crest of a wave when everything's going well and uh and, you, know, you sit there and take uh, take the uh the the credit for it um but as i say it's it's the tough times that make or break you so that that period between 2002 and 2000 and end of 2004 those two and a half years were undoubtedly the toughest of my uh my career um, I offered to resign. We we had a ninety percent fall in our share price, but I always remember it. We, when we came out of it on Christmas Eve, two thousand and four, uh, when we when we reached a settlement with the regulator, twenty one firms, including the HSBCs, UBSs of this world, everyone signed up. Uh, we were a better company as a result of that, and we were much more risk averse. So I, I was especially wary of geared structures. So we, we didn't get into CDOs or CLOs because I, I, I thought to myself, you know, I've seen, this, I've seen this before. So that was the biggest lesson I've probably learned is gearing is the thing that takes you down rather than liquidity, gearing. These are the things that you've got to be careful of. And, and then during the financial crisis, it was all about liquidity. Where, where, where have we invested our liquidity on behalf of our clients? This sort of thing. So, so I learned a lot during that 2002, 2004 uh, period. And then after it, we did one of the, the best transactions we did, which was to buy um, Morgan Grenfell Asset Management, one of the most famous names in asset management from Deutsche Bank. And I suppose... If there were two deals that really made us, that would be one of them. And one was way back at the beginning of, um, of Aberdeen in 1998, when we bought Sentinel Asset Management. And with it came the Far East capability. And with it came that emerging market capability that we really built Aberdeen on the, 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 the back of. Mm, thank, thank you for that reply and, 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 and full reply as well, Martin. Now, you touched on something there, which I, I was going to touch on later, and I probably will still do. You, you noticed and then you acquired that emerging market interest, which others, I don't think many people were looking at that at the moment because they're so UK centric, you know, but you and the team are like, yeah, we need a bit of exposure to that as well now. Well, yeah, I suppose. I mean, if if I look back on one of the advantages I had in life. It was being born in Malaysia, living there for the first 10 years of my life, and, and also traveling back and forwards there for the next 20 years, because my parents were there for 35 years in total. Um, so I knew where I knew where Asia was, I knew where the Far East was. And you know, I was there at the start of jet engines, uh, the jet engine transformed uh, the Far East. And the, the sort of 60s and 70s. So I'm so old, I remember. Uh, I remember these things. But but yeah, I was always fascinated by Asia, obviously, and I knew the work ethic there. And I was fortunate that 
when we bought the um, the emerging market business with Hugh Young. Hugh was a guy that was passionate about Asia, so passionate that we became one of the first fund managers to move our uh, desk, our Asian desk from London to Singapore. And uh, we were one of the first to establish in Singapore. So it, it was it was probably, you know, up there, up there with the top sort of three, four decisions you make in your career. And it, it was a remarkably easy decision to make. And we were surprised no one else wanted to do it. But to a certain extent, a lot of the Asian fund managers loved living in London and managing money in Asia. So we took the view our fund managers needed to be where they were investing. And, uh, and it, was a, it was a fantastic move for us. And as I say, really, I suppose, made Aberdeen into what it, what, what, what it became. Yeah, very unique in that structure. And um, like you say, it became the largest um, in the UK at one stage. So thank you for that. I want to touch now on what you're doing now, Martin, because, you know, uh, some people say, you know what, you could just be chilling at the beach now, wandering around the world, visiting family, looking at exotic places. But no, you're yeah, back in the city. You started up the Asset Management Consolidator, which is Asset Co. Um, and going from strength to strength. Do you want to give us an overview of Asset Co.? Um, and talk a little bit about all the different nuances and aspects of the business for us, please. Yeah, I, I suppose I, I knew the time was right to leave, uh, to leave Aberdeen. Um, and you always want to go before you're asked to go. So uh, it, was, it was the right time for me to, to do it. And, and I'd always been interested on in being on other boards. So I was a founding director of First Group, which became one of the biggest surface transport companies in the world. I was on the board of Sky, which was fantastic. And, and then I was on the board of Glencore. And I was offered the chairmanship of Revolut by Nick Storonsky because he wanted someone who'd founded a business. So, so it was, it was, I was starting to think about these sort of things. And I also wanted to to put into practice all the things I'd learned uh, at Aberdeen. So uh, with a few of the, my ex-colleagues at Aberdeen who, who all wanted to retire, of course, uh, we started Asset Co. And it's been, it's been good fun. It's been a bit tougher than I thought it would be. Uh, the markets are tough at the moment for small cap and, uh, and the markets are tough for long only asset managers. So I was, uh, yeah, I, it's been slower, but I'm 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 now sort of back taking more of an interest, and uh, and I must admit I'm really enjoying it and enjoying looking at the deals again, looking at what we should be doing. So um, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity out there. The tougher the markets, the more opportunity there is. That's a very good point you've made there, um, because I think. It, it speaks to the individual that you are in the sense of the deals that you've made historically, in the sense of drilling down onto the detail. And some of these companies now are going to be looking for somebody to come in and actually inject some, some capital. And sometimes you take stakes and sometimes you actually look to, to merge with the company. So yeah. um, with regards to that, um, what sort of detail are you looking at? that's often overlooked by other individuals that gives you that edge and your team an edge because you've been there and done it before. Yeah, I, I, I really, uh, I look at, I, I'm, I'm, I look at what the, the revenue is, recurring revenue. That's what always fascinates me. What, what is a recurring revenue? Not, not performance fees or whatever. And I look at the quality of the fund managers because, and, and the people in the business, because Aberdeen, when you look at the senior management team at Aberdeen at the end, Ann Richards came from when we bought Edinburgh Fund Managers, Hugh Young when we bought Sentinel, Gary Marshall when we bought uh, Prolific. So they all came, every single one of them really came from an acquisition we'd made and uh, we always keep the best people. We, we, we love good fund managers. We love talent. We love good distribution people. Uh, so we, we, we really uh, look for quality, I think, uh, more than anything else. So, 
recurring fee revenue and the quality of the people. Those are the two main things we look at. Everything else you can sort, basically. You can sort if there's um, admin problems or regulatory problems or whatever. But, uh, but th those are the two very, very important uh, points. Thank you for that. Um, now, you touched on this a bit earlier, and I'm going to talk, talk about it a bit more now regarding treating people differently. As an investor and an, and an acquirer of businesses, how do you go about and your asset team go about ensuring that mul these multi-skilled professionals within said businesses continue to feel valued and motivated as part of your enlarged group? Yeah, what I mean, what I did at Aberdeen uh, was I never had an office. So I always sat with the fund managers. And I think that was quite uh, quite an important point. I actually, I did have an office, but never used it. I used to sit out in the desk. And if someone wanted a meeting, you would go quickly into the office and then come back out and sit at your your desk. And I think I think that's so important because you can get a feel for um, for a, for how a fund manager is doing, how, how what the mood is on the floor. It's not a dealing room. Yeah, an asset manager room um, area is quieter. Most people are working. Uh, so yeah, you can just get a feel, and you could you also know who the characters are in the room and who's sort of who, who who's good for morale and who's not and these sort of things so uh, there's a whole aspect to it. and i always tried to work at the far end of the room as well so that you had to walk through the entire room to get to your desk i know these sound really weird sort of points but but people want to see you they want to see you're there uh, and especially when things aren't going well, they're very keen to see that you're you're not completely panic stricken and uh, on a quivering wreck. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's it's these small things that uh, that uh, that matter, I think. And that ability to speak to them, they can come and speak to you. You can go for a drink with them. If uh, yeah, those sort of things. They're, they're all really really important points. Brilliant. And talking talking now a bit more about your shrewd deal making and looking into the details. As a serial deal maker and shrewd analytical number cruncher, am I right in saying that one of the aspects of of, of Asset Co. Parminian was acquired via Asset Aberdeen Asset Management during your tenure uh, for around fifty million pounds or so? Um, but I've done my numbers and I'm looking at it and thinking, well, the estimated value of your staking that right now at asset co is probably worth more than the value of your own market cap of asset co yeah absolutely yeah. so parmenian was a company we bought at aberdeen for 50 odd million or whatever it is uh aberdeen had two other platforms after i left and decided to sell parmenian so we we teamed up with preservation capital and bought it for i can't even remember but sub 100 and uh, yeah, that business is probably worth 275, 300 million today. We have about a 30% share. So, yeah, I mean, I think our stake is probably worth, you know, 75, 80 million, something like that, maybe even slightly more, because I think there's going to be consolidation in that, uh, in that sector. And it'll be absolutely fascinating to see what price. 7IM sells Caledonia, as you know, are selling 7IM. That's going to be a really interesting benchmark for the sector. I think it will lead to a bit of consolidation. So, yeah, I think it's a very exciting sen uh, sector. It's got a, it, uh, Parmenian has an excellent CEO in Martin Jennings. And, you know, we, we, we to a certain extent, backed him during the the time at Aberdeen and then obviously in the buyout from Aberdeen. So yeah, really, really good company. And as you say, um, not, not really recognized in the share price at the moment, but, but what I would say is there's a lot of companies where value is not recognized in the share price at the moment. So we're not unique in that. I think, I think my view is, control what you can control, run the business as well as you can. And at some stage, 
yeah, share prices will reflect the reality. But there's no point sort of looking at the share price of companies every day and sort of worrying about it or, or else you start to do the wrong thing short term. You should do make the right long term decisions and and run and, and control what you can control. Brilliant. Love that response. Now, you, you we've talked about already the quality of the leaders that you actually buy within these businesses. And one of the ones I've tracked and looked at for many, many years is, is the brilliant Colin McLean of SVM. And you yeah. managed to buy that business recently and you've kept him on board as well, which I think is an absolute coup. You know, very well done with that. Yeah, I know. He's brilliant. He, he is. Yeah, he his. I'd same with Hugh Sargent at River and Mercantile. He and Hugh, Indeed. he and he and Colin are probably similar. They're great value investors, but it's been the wrong sectors to be in. Uh, same with Hugh Young at uh, Aberdeen. These have been tough times for these really, really top investors. But you've just got to you've got to continue to back them and. I, I, to a certain extent, I'm a value investor myself, and I love value investing. So, um, yeah, Colin's always been a fund manager I've admired incredibly, and he's yeah, he, he's he's great. It, it, he, he yeah, he's he's reaching in his own terms the end of his career. So this was a good deal for him and a really good deal for us. And. He'll phase himself out gradually over the next few years and uh, look after all the money he's made for himself. So he's, uh, I don't feel sorry for him, by the way. I don't feel sorry for him uh, uh, retiring. He's done, he's, he's had a phenomenal career and, and he's a really great fund manager. I think that's what I really yes. like about him. He's passionate about the stocks. I think, I think, you know, the difference between me and the, the Hugh Youngs and the Colin McLeans is I'm more passionate about, I'm passionate about the business of asset management. They're passionate about the stocks of uh, asset management. And they're two very, very separate uh, things. Brilliant. I love that response. Now, I want to touch on the, the, the rapid growth of um, ETFs now, if I may, uh, Martin, and your, your purchase of Rise ETF. Um, gave you your group exposure to ETFs, one of the fastest growing assets classes in, out there for wealth management at the moment. Can you give us a little bit more of nuance and expand on the Rise ETF business, please? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, I've made two big mistakes during my uh, asset management career. One of them was not seeing when I was at Aberdeen the rise of ETFs, and the other was not seeing the rise of private markets. Because those are the two areas that there has been phenomenal growth in, really. So um, private markets uh, have really taken a lot. One of the reasons the long-only guys are suffering so much is because, of course, the big, well, the big sovereign wealth funds, especially the Canadians, some of these types have been taking money out of listed markets, long only asset managers and investing them in, uh, in private, uh, private markets. And the other, uh, the other thing has been the rise of passive, of course, with especially with the iShares of this world. And that has led to fee compression within the long only business. Now, the area I really like is thematic uh, ETFs because I, my my view is ETFs are a distribution channel like mutual funds used to be, like uh, investment trusts are, these sort of things. So, yeah, I think we've probably reached the top of the open-ended fund market and we're seeing the rise of, uh, of, of ETFs. So, yeah, it's a really interesting, uh, really interesting area. Hasn't done as well as we would have liked. I mean, it's had a very tough time over the last couple of years, just like all other ETF providers. The markets have, have not been kind, really, I suppose, to thematic um, thematic ETFs, but but a very good company and uh, and uh, and 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 always been in net inflow as well, which has been uh, which has been great. 
Brilliant. You, uh, thank you for res that response as well. I really appreciate that. You touched on the fact it's a really difficult time for markets now and for value investors, et cetera, and even for, for e ETFs and thematics. Um, everyone's having a, a difficult sort of 18 months in the market. But as a long-term investor, um, successful investor, Martin, um, where should investors and yourselves be looking um, for, mo for most significant growth over the next three to 10 years? Because we talk about investors being long-term, but a lot of them, as soon as there's an hiccup, they, they choose not to be <laughs> long-term investors. Yeah, I think I, you know, one of the trends, I, I've always been a great believer in going against trends. I mean, obviously, you can't buck trends, but you can also look and see what the advantages are of bucking the trends. So one of the things we've really seen over the last 10, 15 years has been the demise of what I would term UK fund, UK long only mandates. So we've seen uh, we've seen most of the what well, a we've seen most of the pension funds in the UK, <coughs> excuse me, disinvesting from uh, UK equities uh, and putting more into gilts or whatever to hedge their uh, liabilities. But we've also seen the move from UK equities to global equities as an asset class. So there is huge value in the UK market, um, huge value obviously in UK mid cap and huge, even more value in UK small cap. So um, if you can find sort of really, really good unloved small caps at the moment growing at 20% on very low single digit price earning multiples you just need to hold them for a couple of years and uh you know you're going to double your money i mean it's uh it's 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 an asset class that's completely unloved and of course the private equity are running the their ruler over every single one of them and uh, the number of the number of them being bought are, are incredible so uh, so I expect that trend to continue in UK small cap, mid cap. Um, then, yeah, the so I like the UK market. I've always thought the American market has been overvalued, which I've got completely wrong, of course. But uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, and I, I still love ASEAN. Uh, I love ASEAN and I love India. I mean, I think if there's one market above all else that I like it, in terms of of where growth is going to be it's expensive but it would be india i think it's got i think it's got everything it's got it's got growth it's got reasonable governance in the companies which they've inherited from us brits um just in terms of the legal structures and in fact they can they can take what we what we've given them and taken it to a new extreme as you know so they're they're better rule followers than we than even we are in the uh, in the UK. But but no, I love the Indian market. Brilliant. No, thank thank you for that. Now you touched on the Indian market. I want to continue that, if I may, um, with regards to Asset Co and its various different platforms and funds, etc. How much exposure can uh, an investor get via Asset Co to the Indian market? Yeah, we bought a very small business called Ocean Dial, but it, what I loved about it was it had a closed end fund with a really good track record in India, a very good fund manager based in India. So uh, it's really good. It's a really, really good. And look, uh, in India, you can only do it through. I, I would never recommend buying single stocks in India. It's too too difficult to market. It's, it's difficult enough for fund managers to manage uh, money in India. But definitely closed end funds, open ended funds, investing in India are really, really uh, the way to go. In the UK, you want to be buy, you know, you can buy single single stocks there. Um, there's plenty of research on that. But uh, but yeah, I, I, I that's the way to go is to uh, is to buy an investment trust. I always think. Martin, well, I want to start now, if I may, regarding ESG investing and asset co. However active strategy to launch products which invest in unquoted companies, uh, particularly unquoted companies in the, the ESG universe. Please, can you expand on this for our listeners as to how can they can get access to this, please? Yeah, I think I think ESG is a really, it, it, it's, it's something that's come up, of course, and 
And if you're an active long only asset manager, you need to you need to take ESG into account before you invest in um, in in a company. And it's good to see that it's not just governance any longer. So you know, four or five years ago, it would just have been governance. So it would be most most of my time was fending off criticism that we. And uh, voted against some CEO's salary or something like that. So, so it's now expanded, as you know, to look at sustainability, these sort of things, and and that's important. Um, I think I think we, uh, you know, one of my bugbears is we sort of over oversimplify it and and think that sustainability is a is a supply side problem i.e if we i'm living in aberdeen i obviously feel passionate about this that if we stop exploring for oil in aberdeen it's going to solve the um, it's going to solve climate change my view is we've also got to look upon it as a demand side problem as well we've got to look at we've got to look at seeing how we can cut the demand for oil or coal or uh, gas or whatever it is, because then the supply side will follow. Um, and it's been very interesting being on the Glencore board, where the majority of our director of, of our shareholders want us to continue investing in coal. They want us to continue owning the coal assets. They don't want us to sell them to private equity or or other sovereign wealth funds, uh, i.e. coming out of the public domain. So it's a, it's a fascinating argument and it's really, really become such a big, uh, it's become such a big area now over the last sort of two to three years with climate change and, and, uh, and, and how, how we should, how we should um, control, uh, what we should do about it. And I thought Tony Blair made a very good point, I think earlier this week, uh, saying, look, we must, we must work with China. There cannot be any chain. We, we, without China, we cannot get climate. We cannot control climate change. I'm not, using, I'm not, control, I'm not actually expressing myself that well. But the point he made was China is vital to this whole area. Brilliant. No, thank, thank you. Now, Ma Martin, touching straight onto what you've just said there, you're the, the chairman of the Net Zero Technology Centre. Can you tell us a little bit about that and your the importance of that and the, the role that you have within it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, the Net Zero Technology Centre is uh, based in Aberdeen. Uh, it's funded by the UK government and the Scottish government. And it's there to help with technology um, to invest in the technology to make uh, the both the offshore oil industry, the offshore gas industry, and also the uh, the offshore floating wind industry, these sort of areas more more um, uh, more efficient. And uh, we developed the technology in conjunction with a lot of these uh, companies, the oil companies, the gas companies, the offshore wind companies, and then we give it to everyone. So uh, we don't actually charge for it. It's a, it's a really great, great uh, concept and, um, and, and makes a difference. And, and the plan is to make, make these industries more efficient, make them uh, make them more greener i suppose to use uh, to use that word but uh, but very very important organization based in uh, based in aberdeen as i say brilliant now with regards to asset co how are asset co embracing the net zero strategy yeah i mean like all asset managers as i say we've had to invest much much more in esg uh, much much more in our governance and how we look at companies that we uh, that we invest in because it's not it, it you 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 now our clients are demanding that we look at these areas and especially uh, especially the younger generation as they get more money 
inheriting it from their parents or whatever it might be or making it themselves they're much more interested in impact than than anything else so impact's going to be a big area of asset management in the the years ahead i.e only investing in companies that are doing uh doing good whereas esg you can invest in the shells and bps of this world because they're in the eyes of investors behaving responsibly, they're going to wind down their, uh, their, their, their oil, these sort of things over a long period of time. So, um, so it's those sort of things are the, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating area of our business now. Brilliant. Thank you. Now you, you touched on earlier, um, other than the, you know, the ESG side of it, net zero side, of it, obviously um, investors want to see returns on investing on investments and you touched on the importance of looking at recurring revenue. With regards to investors, what other piece of vital analytics that they need to be looking at, which are often overlooked when actually assessing, because they look at, oh, assets under management are outflows, and they go, oh, need to move on to the next one. What are they missing in the nuance of long-term investing, the detail that they should drill down on? Yeah, there's, there is a sort of fascination with flows within the business, and and of course, Asset management is an incredible industry because it, it it is largely a fixed cost business. And if you if you're doing well, money flows in. If you're doing badly, money flows out. So hence the reason the analysts monitor flows better than we as a management team do. They, uh, I mean, some analysts know your know our companies, the asset management companies, better than we do. So uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's 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 amazing. So what would I look at again? You, you look at you look at performance and you look at how they're achieving performance. You look at whether they've got the team approach or a star fund manager approach. Uh, obviously, if you've got a star fund manager approach, you're more susceptible to a underperformance with that or whether he leaves or whatever. If you've got the team approach, it, it tends to slow down decision making and maybe makes it less um, less entrepreneurial, but but you know, there are advantages. Aberdeen, we always went with the team approach. And um, and it worked. River is more a named fund manager approach. And to a certain extent, the retail, the retail, the the direct customer or the IFA, they love a they love a story about a fund manager. So to a certain extent, it's horses for courses in those uh, in those areas. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. Now, I, I wasn't going to ask this, but I'll ask it now. Um, okay. With regards to strategies, there's always a question being asked as to whether to go multi-asset or equities. You know, you must get caught between that conversation very often. Yeah, I think... Look, it's uh, it depends. It depends how skillful you are, uh, doesn't it? And what what your passion is. I mean, I'm always, I'm always. Uh, of course, I love equities. I love funds. I love these sort of things. So, uh, but multi assets are great area as well. I mean, I wish I'd love to own a multi asset uh, business. I mean, I think uh, some of them are really excellent. They're great. They're great. They're great pickers of fund managers, and uh, it's um, no, it's a it's a great area, and and the key is, as you and I both know, not to uh, not to fall too much in love with a with a fund manager, and it's the same with stocks. I mean, that's why I like market makers when they discuss stocks. They're dispassionate about the stock; they don't care what that stock does. They're only interested Absolutely. in whether it's going up or down, whereas fund managers fall in love with their stocks and uh, and um, you know can hold them too long. I've always thought at Aberdeen we were great buyers of stocks, but we weren't that great at selling them. So we tended to stick with them because our average holding period would be 10, 15, 20 years. So, uh, and it was always too much hassle to sell that one and try and find another stock that was as good. So. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's fascinating business. It's it's look, we're privileged to be in the asset management business, the investing business. It's uh, it's an absolute. It's 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 just such good fun. Thank you for that reply. Now, Martin, I want to ask about some personal stuff now regarding your own 
personal investing style, strategy, methodology, away from, you know, having your money in, you know, in shares elsewhere. Where do you invest? What, what's, your, what's your style? Are you a, a lumpy investor? Do you, do you put things in monthly? Do you just buy things whole? Yeah, I, I suppose. Well, I've always been a big investor in Asia through our uh, funds at Aberdeen, especially our closed end funds. So I love that. Then I like I like property. I like farms. I've got quite a few farms, so I enjoy I enjoy farming. My 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 family, my parents and my grandparents and parents before that were all farmers. So when my father was in the agricultural business in Malaysia, so uh, so it was really it's more a return to my roots that. Uh, but I do I invest in. I, I've probably got too many private market investments. Uh, so I've been lucky. I've made a lot of money in some of them, especially Revolut. I've been lucky there. That was that's been a that's been a real real home run. Uh, Revolut. I mean, this company is remarkable. It it signs up sixty seventy thousand customers a a day. Uh, it's bigger. It signs up more people than PayPal now per day in Europe. So, yeah, we're over 30 million customers. So it's a remarkable uh, business. So I've been lucky enough to be an investor there. So yeah, I've probably too many in private markets, but uh, I enjoy, I enjoy, I enjoy investing, and I enjoy building businesses as well. That's what I. That's my passion is building building businesses. Brilliant. Thank, thank you for that response. And uh, I agree that Revolut is doing absolutely fantastically well. Now, I'm going to ask you quite a, a curveball question here, if I may, Martin. Um, yeah. away, from, away from investing, you've already touched on the farming side, and away from your business successes, what are you most proud of? Gosh, I mean, inevitably, you're proud of your family. So I, I suspect that's the standard answer. So probably what am I next most proud of? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of. I'm proud of some of the businesses I've helped build, I would say, outside Aberdeen, you know, first group these sort of things. I mean, we built, so yeah. Um, I wish I was a better golfer. I wish I was a better skier, you know, these sort of things. So I'm not that proud of my golfing and skiing prowess, but uh, yeah, I'm proud of, I suppose I'm proud of what I've done for Aberdeen, the image of Aberdeen. Um, Aberdeen Asset Management really helped it uh not as much as alec ferguson did but yeah i'm proud of what i've what i've achieved of what we have achieved from um from an oil town in the north of scotland i suppose i would say i love that response and th thank you for for sharing that and i think you are up there with um with sir alex um regardless of what, <laughs> what anyone else thinks um please can i just ask you then now um a lot of people don't know about some of the things that you actually do away from you know the glare of the press and all the rest of it but do please share some of the charitable endeavors that you are very very passionate about yeah i've i've done a lot of charity stuff i mean i i you know i've, I've helped a lot of charities in aberdeen and so on i and i've spent a lot of time on golf I, uh, actually one of the things i'm very proud of is um you know, Alex Salmond, the first minister of Scotland, phoned me up and said, Martin, we don't have a sponsor for the Scottish Open. This is the best week on the uh, the golf tour, European golf tour is the week before the Open. Will you take it on as sponsor and help build it? And we built it up into the best tournament on the European tour with the best field. Uh, and really, really made it a global event. And then we did it for the ladies. I, I said to our team, look, guys, we can't just do this for men's golf. We've got to do it for ladies golf. So I suppose I'm very proud of what we've done for ladies golf. I really, really love ladies golf and, and playing, with the, playing with the lady professionals is a phenomenal experience because they're not hitting it 
a hundred yards beyond you, what they show you is they hit it about the same distance, but they keep it on the fairway the whole time. So it's a fantastic. Uh, so I've loved, I've loved helping, uh, I've loved helping build golf into what it is. I'm chairman of Scottish Golf, which I love. I'm on the board of the European Tour. I'm on the board at Wentworth, so I enjoy the golfing side as uh, as as well. Brilliant! I, lo I love that reply, and I love the fact you've done so much for golf and for ladies' golf. But you did touch on there again about politics, and I've got to ask this question. It's just me being nosy. Um, you went to law school, the University of Aberdeen, with Alistair Darling, who became the Chancellor of Exchequer under the Prime Minister Gordon Brown, another Scot. Um, did you ever have any interest in pursuing a political career at all? No, not really. It doesn't pay enough. <laughs> no, I, I'm not really. I, I prefer to, I prefer to uh, work with the politicians rather than uh, work with them rather than be be part of them. Because if you're part of them, as you know, they'll just kill you. They're, 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 <laughs> there's no camarade, camaraderie. <laughs> they're at uh, they're competing with each other, so uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, um, and I'm sorry we don't get sorry more don't really, get more. really good people into uh, into politics. But it's look, it is a fantastic, uh, and Alistair Darling is a phenomenal politician. He's one of the few that uh, under promises and over delivers, rather than over promise and under deliver. No, thank, thank you for that. I just had to be cheeky. Now, Mar Martin, I've got two final questions for you. Um, you executed absolutely brilliantly with Aberdeen Asset Management. Please, can you reiterate to the institutions, the family offices, iNet Worth individuals, fund managers, investment analysts, and private investors that are listening to this Investing Matters podcast, um, your long-term goals and um, aspirations for Asset Co? Because I've, I've noticed somewhere that you're one of your goals is to, for it to be a FTSE 250 company. Can you tell us a bit sure. more about that and reiterate, you know, your, your, your drive for this? Yeah, well, luck, sadly, we're a long way away from that. But I've, I've always been, you know, I know I'm repeating myself here. Uh, so my view is control what you can control. So what we'll do is execute what we can. I'm very focused on uh, executing the deals we've done at the moment. I'm very focused on realizing value for our stake in Parmenian at some stage. Um, these sort of things, that's what I'm really concentrating on at the moment. And, and then let the market decide for itself uh, what, what valuation should be placed on, uh, on the company. Uh, because m most CEOs always say their stocks are undervalued. Uh, so uh, I haven't come across a CEO who said his stock is overvalued recently, but uh, I'm sure there are some out there. So, yeah, I mean, just, I love, I love just execute what you can do. That's my strong advice to uh, CEOs. Just control what you can control. Brilliant. Now, Martin, my final question is, um, how would you like to be remembered, given all the things that you've done and, and achieved um, for, for Aberdeen, for the UK, um, for the investment industry? Oh, gosh, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. It's always surprised me. Uh, you know, as I say, it's always surprised me at the end of each year how much we achieve. So uh, I've, I, I've, I, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm honestly, it still surprises me how much I've achieved in my career. I'm abs I'm I'm more surprised than anyone else. I can assure you. Most people, I mean, I mean, apart from my family, who of course think that I'm completely incompetent, uh, so there sad. are lots of there are lots of people who are surprised at what I've achieved. But I'm more surprised than they are. I can assure you. Oh, Martin, you've been absolutely phenomenal on this interview. Thank you for your kindness and humility and for sharing your your insights. Uh, I wish you very, very best of, of success with, with Asset Co. And to our uh, global listeners, this was Martin Gilbert, FRSE, Executive Chairman of AIM Listed Asset Co. PLC. 
Martin, thank you ever so much for being on this investing no, matters thank you. with me. Thank you, Peter. I'm more proud of my CA than I am of my FRS chartered accountant. That was the that oh, was the well, that's, qualification. that's how you got started. Brilliant. Yeah, no, that's, that's how you it. got started. It's all about the foundations, yeah. isn't it? Yep, yep. Take care. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for uh, thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. God bless you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Investing Matters. Be sure to check out the London Southeast website for free tools and info to research your next investment. You can also join in the conversation on our social media channels. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content, including our CEO interviews. Catch you next time.